Okay, I think we're going to get started. Uh, is that okay, Nimi? Excellent. So, um, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Mario Novelli. I'm the director of the Centre for International Education and co, co principal investigator of the Peer Network. Um, welcome everyone um, to week five of the Peer Network lecture series The Political Economy of Education in Times of Conflict, Crisis, and Pandemics. Um, this is a GCRF AHRC funded network between the Centre for International Education, University of Sussex, the University of Cape Town, Nazarbayev University, Kazakhstan, and the University of Ulster, uh, aiming to promote engagement with critical political economy analysis of education in contexts of conflict and crisis. The lecture series is also supported by UCFIAT, the UK Forum on International Education and Training. Um, all of our lectures are live streamed through YouTube and available afterwards and will become free uh, and part of an open source uh, resource for all those interested in learning and sharing knowledge and practice about the political economy of education. Um, and please do sign up to our CIE YouTube page. Um, I'm very happy to say that today's session is led by my colleague and friend, Dr. Nimi Hoffman from the Center for International Education, University of Sussex, entitled The Construction and Survival of an Intellectual Community During Structural Adjustment in Africa. Um, before I introduce her, I just want to briefly run through a few housekeeping rules. Um, first of all, please, uh, if you could mute yourselves unless you're asking a question in the Q&A. Um, during uh, Nimi's uh, lecture, uh, could you please ask any questions through the chat function? I'll collate them and ask you to come back and ask the question in the Q&A. Uh, Nimi will talk for around 35 to 40 minutes and then we will then have a seven minute Sussex bars where I'll put you all in small breakout rooms so that you can reflect and discuss the content of the lecture. And uh, then I'll bring you back in um, for uh, a plenary Q&A session. Um, we will try uh, to finish promptly at 2.15 p.m. UK time. So just a few words uh, about Nimi Hoffman. She is a lecturer at the Centre for International Education at the University of Sussex in the UK and a research associate at the Centre for International Teacher Education at Cape Peninsula University of Technology in South Africa. Her research interests are in the area of intellectual history and social policy. She completed her PhD at Rhodes University in South Africa, which focused on how a Pan-African knowledge commons emerged and endured. And we're very happy to have her talk about that today. Her current work aims to deepen this line of investigation, as well as exploring the research policy nexus in education, particularly in terms of social experimentation. She serves as co-editor for the Journal of Contemporary African studies and since coming to CIE she's made a wonderful impact both in teaching and research and really in, uh, enriched our intellectual environment so thank you Nime um, the zoom is yours uh, you need to I'll stop my share now and you can uh, take control of the screen Thank you, Mario. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great. Um, thank you everyone who joined today. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to think about how intellectual communities endure crisis. And as a way of starting this conversation today, I'd like to reflect on this image by Feli Seneso, um, who's a Senegalese artist, um, and he, this image was selected for the Dakar Biennale this year, and it's titled Infected. Perhaps it's about the pandemic, but when I look at it, I also see the uncertainty, the confusion, the sharp edges and pain, and the beauty of life before the pandemic. And I think that's because late capitalism is in a state of permanent crisis. So the question of how intellectual communities survive is not limited to this particular moment of crisis, but is rather a deeper question about how we survive at all. And as a way of thinking through this, I'm going to focus on structural adjustments in Africa, which as Tandi Kamakandawira once remarked, 
was a period of economic collapse that was deeper and longer lasting than the American Great Depression. Structural adjustment was typically imposed in the name of development and was accompanied by the rise of authoritarian regimes and civil conflict. Intellectual communities couldn't emerge unscathed. As public funding collapsed, universities' capacity for research declined. Scholars left the continent en masse and serious postgraduate training came to a halt. Academic journals and publishers folded and book famines became commonplace across the continent. And yet some intellectual communities endured. This talk focuses on one prominent example, the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa or Cadestria. It's just one of several examples. So I, I don't want to give the impression that it's uh, the only or the most important example, um, but it is the longest standing pan-African intellectual organization on the continent. And so the question I ask today is, how did Cadestria manage to weather the storms of adjustment? The story I'm going to tell is about the interplay between ideas and political economy constraints. People tend to think about adjustment in terms of the politics of the belly, but we all have an intellectual history and we all have a right to intellectual labor. Cadestria recognized this and framed their analysis of adjustment in terms of its impact on society's capacity to think autonomously. It used this analysis to both sustained intellectual and organizational defense of free thought. So today, I want to persuade you that Cadestria survived in part because when faced with existential precarity, it chose to engage in intense collective introspection and deliberation. Uh, let's see if we can move on, there we go. So who are Cadestria? Um, so they're a pan-African, uh, it's the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, and it's pan-African. So it's from Egypt to South Africa, from Senegal to Kenya. Um, and it was conceptualized in 1964 and then formalized in 1973. Um, the initial scholars who sort of uh, hatched the idea of Kadestria was a, a Nigerian scholar, Adebolo Onitiri, and a Sudanese scholar, Uma Usman. Um, but it was really only formalized and got a building in 1973 with Samia Amin, uh, the Egyptian uh, dependency theorist. And the idea was that it would um, aim to foster greater collaboration between scholars in order to challenge the marginalization of African intellectual work. So today it acts as a pan-African forum for critiquing and generating intellectual work, and it provides training and support oops, sorry, um, to, to young scholars and established scholars across the continent. It is managed by a community of scholars rather than state institutions, for-profit organizations or donors, and the governance structures are democratically elected every three years following public deliberation and a general assembly. Quite remarkably, um, all of the work in Cadestria is open access and has been pretty much since inception. Um, so since the 1960s, it has been committed to making its work freely available to African universities uh, well before the advent of the internet. Um, and its work is available in languages such as Arabic, French, English, and Portuguese. Because it is managed by a community of scholars and because it doesn't put a paywall on its work, it's committed to the principle of open access and has been well before we even had the language of, of, of open access. Um, we can think about it as a knowledge commons. Uh, knowledge commons is a system in which intellectual goods are managed and produced by community through a process of collective action and self-governance. So if you look at this table here, um, we can divide goods into private, public, club, or common goods, depending on whether they are privately owned or not privately owned, um, and managed by a community or not managed by a community. So an example of a private good might be Thomson Reuters, predating upon our scholarship. Um, an example of club goods are the learned societies of the 18th century. 
an example of a public good might be a public university. And an example of a commonly managed good would be things like Wikipedia, the Human Genome Project, and Cadestria. And notably here, Cadestria was founded way before Wikipedia or the Human Genome Project. So it's an example of kind of quite fundamental innovation. Um, the thing about all of these goods, if you, know, if you look at them quite carefully, you'll see that there's nothing inherent to the good that makes it either private or club, common or public. It's really a decision about how we, we, we choose to manage that good. And so the initial theorists behind um, uh, these different types of goods, um, Elena Ostrom and her husband, um, eventually came to the position that um, it's less a statement of fact and more theoretical perspective. And the theoretical perspective of the knowledge commons is, is that it seeks to understand how systems become path dependent and how a community can act collectively to change this path dependency. And I'll return to this notion of path dependency uh, towards the end of the talk. Okay, so just as a kind of a quick recap as to what structural adjustment was, um, it's sometimes referred to in the language of austerity, but it was a lot more profound than just basic austerity. As a bit of context, um, there was an oil crisis in the 1970s, which uh, then was then followed by collapse in general commodity prices, crises and a series of droughts. And so there was a balance of payment problem for African governments. They didn't have enough dollars to pay their international loans. And so they approached the IMF and the World Bank for emergency financing, which was provided on condition that they implement reforms known as structural adjustment. So by 1989, 36 African countries had undergone at least one structural adjustment program, if not more. Um, and the conditionalities of these programs were very complex and often tacitly contested and resisted, but they typically included the following reforms, devaluation of currency, a privatization of state-owned companies, a reduction of taxes, a prioritization of external debt over domestic spending and divestment from public goods and the introduction of user fees. So for example, if prior to structural adjustment, most African countries had universal free public education um, or universally free public education, excuse me, um, during structural adjustment, tuition fees were introduced into, into primary schools and high schools and universities. So what did this mean in practice? Um, it meant that there was a, um, during this period, there was a rapid decline in countries' GDPs per capita. Um, they lost most of the post-independence gains. Um, they deindustrialized and reverted back to colonial specializations. Um, by the late 1980s, external debt had grown to the extent that a number of countries were classified as insolvent and were forced to allocate the overwhelming majority of their budget to servicing debt. At the same time, there was a substantial reduction in spending on public goods, such as healthcare and education. And you can see in this graph on the right-hand side, um, which is just a little picture that I put together for you guys, the green line at the top is countries that were not adjusted, and the blue line at the bottom is countries that were adjusted. And you can see that while they were converging in the 1970s, as the adjustment period took off, they started to diverge really quite um, sort of starkly in terms of spending on education. Um, this was then, you know, this decline in, in spending on healthcare and education and so on was accompanied by widespread increases in malnutrition and mortality. So a lot of people died and a lot of people died much younger. And this was in turn accompanied by heightened political crises and civil conflict as adjustment further eroded the, legit the legitimacy of the state. So by 1989, 35 countries were under military rule. Okay. Um, so in the beginning, Kadesha responded to this by critiquing uh, structural adjustment programs and its broader impact on African societies. But when faced with international financial institutions that were unmoved by empirical evidence, cadastral scholars began paying closer attention to the process of research and policy formation underlying adjustment. They documented the ways in which the data and models underlying economic reforms were seldom public or subject to peer review and often hopelessly out of date and riddled with errors. And yet, 
as they argued, African policy alternatives to structural adjustment were similarly unfettered by empirical rigor or the need to engage with state of the art African scholarship. As Ibo Hutchful has written, in the resulting discourse of the blind, the side with the money usually won. This marginalization of African research, they stressed, was part of the broader anti-democratic thrust of structural adjustment programs, which were often presented as a fait accompli to parliament and the public alike, with no scope for discussion or dissent. Reflecting on this period, Ralph Mustafa argued that these poorly informed attempts by a small band of elites to re-engineer African societies without their knowledge or consent undermined the political space for public deliberation and informed consensus building. So for cadastral scholars, the restructuring of African universities was part of this assault on public deliberation. Universities weren't only subject to rapid funding cuts, but were also placed under the effective stewardship of the World Bank, which demanded that they introduce tuition fees, source new income from consultancies and donors, close down unprofitable courses, and only purchase books and journals sanctioned by the bank. Cadestra began documenting the effects of this in the bulletin, the organization's newsletter, and during this period, four themes emerged very clearly. The first is that universities resisted adjustment and wave after wave of academic and student strikes took place across the continent. Confronted with this crisis of legitimacy, African states chose increasingly militarized responses, often arresting, killing, or torturing academics and students. So this was a direct assault on academic freedom. Second, divestment from higher education undermined academic freedom indirectly. Um, so as Alex Bangirana commented, you can't publish on ignorance, and the lack of funding of research is actually a limitation on academic freedom to write and report exactly on what's happening. Third, the rise of donor patronage resulted in intellectual and institutional distortions. As Ibrahim Wanda uh, says, most of the people who wrote very juicy stories about the promise of structural adjustment were African scholars themselves who wanted to be taken away from the universities to work in consultancies that had been established by various funding agencies as a moral and an intellectual justification for structural adjustment. And fourth, nearly 100,000 Africans with university degrees left the continent for the global north. One of the consequences of this Tandika Mkandawira argued, was a dislocation in institutional memory and the transmission of knowledge, with the result that the institutional basis for the reproduction of the next generation of scholars was profoundly damaged. So these intellectual preoccupations suggest a sociological turn in thinking about the academic project. As Paul Zeleza writes, much of the urgency and poignancy of Cadestra's writings in this period derive from the intimate acquaintance with the ways in which the disintegration of the fabric of society necessarily involves an assault on a society's ability to think autonomously. So in light of this, Cadestra's community began to conceptualize its defense of the academic project as part of broader social struggles for sovereignty and democracy. And this defense took on two inter interrelated forms, an intellectual defense and an organizational defense. The intellectual defense assumed the shape of intense collective introspection on the nature of the academic project. So at their General Assembly in 1988, they made a decision to host the first Pan-African Conference on Intellectual Freedom, which resulted in the Kampala Declaration on Intellectual Freedom and Social Responsibility. It moved beyond the notion of professional academics to include intellectuals in general and articulates freedom as a necessary condition for intellectuals to fulfill their responsibilities to society. In other words, intellectual freedom is the freedom to serve. As such, it marks a significant departure from interna international declarations of academic freedom from this time, such as the Lima Declaration. While the latter provides the negative definition of freedom in terms of the absence of restraint, the Kampala Declaration provides a positive definition of freedom in terms of the capacity to serve society. 
Moreover, it specifies the economic and political conditions required for the exercise of social responsibility. Whereas the Lima Declaration makes no reference to these conditions and instead sets out academic freedom as an element of universal human rights, which abstracts the realization of the right to academic freedom from the political and economic struggles of the academic community. So one can see the emergence of a distinctive and new conceptualization of academic freedom as a component of a broader class of intellectual freedoms grounded in the social responsibilities of intellectuals. It's significant because the Kampala Declaration represents the fruits of the first sustained reflections on the academic project by a pan-African community. For this reason, it continues to function as the main reference point for conceptualizing academic freedom and investigating its breaches on the continent today. And it was actually um, because, of, because of this declaration, for instance, a number of um, African countries have academic freedom now enshrined in their constitutions as a human right. However, the relationship between intellectual freedom and social responsibility isn't uncomplicated or uncontested. And its conceptualization on the Kampala Declaration was an outcome of heated debates. Much of that debate was about the internal dynamics of universities and how they played an important role in shaping the limits and possibilities of academics and their freedoms. In turning critique upon themselves, they were able to periodize African universities and craft the concept of the developmental university. This term arose from the fact that most African universities were set up in the post-independence period by nationalist governments with strong uh, uh, developmental agendas. And as Mahmoud Mamdani has argued, they were established within the narrow confines of a state logic, with the aim of providing a training ground for personnel that would manage the process of development. So this placed strong limitations on the social role of academics. On the one hand, as Claude Ake tried to show, the state's narrow emphasis on relevance to an elite project undercut the development university's broader social relevance and impeded the formation of broader alliances against structural adjustment. On the other hand, as feminist scholars like Ayesha Imam and Amina Mama sought to demonstrate, the anti-democratic ethos of the developmental university limited the space for critical argument and dissent necessary for developing more creative and effective responses to structural adjustment. So as Mamdani pointed out, the bank's demand for academic relevance was actually just a return to the developmental logic of the independent state, but without its ambition or vision. In effect then, Kadesha's community tried to excavate the way in which the crisis of higher education wasn't solely an outcome of external interventions from actors like the World Bank and authoritarian states. Rather, it reflected the interplay between external actors and the internal dynamics of the, of the developmental university. And this conceptualization of the developmental university in turn brought to the fore the historical transformation of African universities and structural adjustment. By doing so, it created conceptual space for investigating the ways in which Africans might themselves transform universities into more democratic and socially accountable institutions. In doing so, their collective introspection catalyzed a new body of literature on the university as a potential public sphere and the ways in which inequalities diminish its publicness. Second, the conceptualization of the developmental university brought into sharp relief the limitations and problems of research that was overly statist and vanguardist in orientation. Prior to this, all of Kadesha's research projects were tied to the concept of development, such as education and development or gender and development. And as Paul Zaletza has argued, the preoccupation with development in African scholarship largely reflected the concerns of nationalists who preyed at the altar of development, as well as interests of former colonial powers for whom development served as a handy substitute for the tattered rhetoric of civilization, discredited by the horrendous barbarism of World War II, and as a plea against national charges of colonial exploitation. As a consequence, the language of development was at least in part an outcome of the ways in which the academy was influenced by external political actors. This locked Afri uh, critical African scholars into what Zaleza calls a deconstructionist tradition, which compelled them to respond to the empirical distortions of an externally set intellectual agenda. <laughs> 
This had become a central preoccupation in Cadestro's community. And by the early 90s, a decision was made to drop the language of development and initiate a series of major projects on social movements, democracy, and later intellectual history. This didn't preclude developmentalist scholarship, but it created space for scholars to set their own intellectual agenda. And so this suggests that Cadestra's collective introspection, painful as it sometimes was, led to an expansion of imagination and paved the way for less reactive, more autonomous intellectual projects. This in turn um, shaped Cadestra's organizational defense of the academic project. So the Kampala Symposium on Intellectual Freedom had been characterized by consensus on the need for an organizational response to the state's attack on African universities. And prior to this, as Abdullah Boudreau remarks, Cadestra's action was often to organize a letter of appeal or protest to the authorities on behalf of the researchers. Does that sound familiar, by the way, in terms of all the job cuts in universities? We write a petition. <laughs> Um, but the Kampala Symposium helped galvanize a more strategic response. Participants made three concrete organizational commitments in defense of academic freedom. The first was a commitment to set up a pan-African organization to monitor violations of academic freedom. The second was a commitment for organizations to provide sanctuary to exiled scholars. And the third was a commitment to lessen dual independence. Importantly, and that's why I've put it in red, Cadestria has never fulfilled that commitment to lessen dual independence. And it's something we could perhaps return to at the end of the talk and the discussion. But it did make good on, on the other two commitments by launching an academic freedom program in 1993. Uh, over and above this, Cadestria focused on supporting the intergenerational renewal of scholarship by funding just over one thousand young scholars to complete their doctoral and master's theses, provided intellectual support through its institutes and workshops, and they published the output of the institutes together with the multinational and networks uh, and national networks that they set up. All of this contributed to a massive growth in pu book publications, which was matched by corresponding growth in journal publications. So in 1976, Cadestra had one journal, Africa Development, um, and its newsletter. But by 2016, it was responsible for publishing 15 peer-reviewed journals. So as a consequence of these organizational and intellectual measures, Cadestria became a younger and a larger organization. Young scholars were not only drawn by the financial and intellectual support that the organization provided, they were also attracted by the new intellectual trajectory of the organization. As Amina Mama put it, um, when she herself was a young scholar at this time, um, attending the Kampala Symposium was an exhilarating introduction to Cadestria. For many of us, she says, at a, a much earlier stage in our scholarly careers, it was an exhilarating discovery of the region's most significant social science network. It was inspiring enough for me to promptly resign my le lectureship at the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague and return home to Nigeria, intent on joining colleagues in the, world, in the work of building independent intellectual spaces. Okay, so it's doubtful that many scholars in the diaspora were similarly inspired to return home. Although the Kampala Declaration didn't actually help motivate scholars in the US to form the Committee for Academic Freedom, um, which is uh, led by Sylvia Federici and um, George Cavensis. But I think Mama's comments indicate the extent to which the organization's new intellectual trajectory helps draw in a younger third generation of African scholars who then became a critical source of intellectual change, particularly by embedding feminist intellectual work in the organization. So such intellectual and organizational growth seems paradoxical, given that African universities were similarly uh, were simultaneously contracting. But as Rafa Mustafa explained, Cadestra became a refuge for a community that was threatened by structural adjustment. And it realized it could do something to address some of those threats. And then it did that. It mobilized people, it mobilized resources, it rose up to the challenge, and by doing so was able to attract attention, resources, prestige. Indeed, many members have spoken of the ways in which Cadestria functioned as a refuge for scholars, fleeing repression, and an almost existential hunger for literature. 
it was able to act as a refuge in part because it had developed into a strong community. But it was also able to draw on the political and economic support of government allies to maintain its autonomy. The Senegalese government provided land, infrastructure, and tax rebates to Cadestrian. And more importantly, it granted diplomatic immunity to Cadestrian, which gave intellectuals crucial protection from hostile African governments. So if you wanted to organize a conference now, you can no longer be some, uh, you know, arbitrarily arrested and thrown in jail um, because you now had diplomatic immunity, um, which is quite extraordinary. I'm not sure that any other government has done that before. Um, secondly, um, Sweden uh, provided important core funding to the organization, which left Cadestria free to choose its own intellectual trajectory. This was part of its unstated strategy of only engaging with funders that would not cultivate patron-client relationships. As one officer put it, many of us would rather die than have the World Bank tell us what to do research on. Okay. So as these are the kind of concluding thoughts on this particular story that I've told. I think Cadestra hasn't acted in a world without significant constraints. Um, in the long term, the decline of public universities has likely weakened the intellectual and institutional basis of Cadestra, and its rapid growth led to uh, negative unintended outcomes, which we could perhaps talk about after the presentation. But I think that faced with the existential precarity of the academic project in Africa, the choice of scholars to respond by engaging in intense collective reflection is a remarkable one. It's difficult to convey the anguish and the precarity of scholars working in this period. For many, it must have been tempting to react by critiquing the external agents driving this assault to the exclusion of all else, or when faced with the sheer scale and depth of the assault, to resign themselves to the situation and opt out by leaving the continent. But their community chose to respond differently by engaging in collective reflection and introspection. This couldn't have been an easy path to take, but it contributed to the flowering of new ideas and ways of thinking, not least a distinctive articulation of academic freedom. So this phase marked the first attempts to elaborate new standards or rules of scholarly excellence. No longer would it be sufficient to critique the intellectual preoccupations of political elites or Northern scholars. It now became increasingly important to elaborate an independent intellectual agenda in which their intellectual community sought to make sense of and trouble their social world on their own terms. So in this sense, to return to the idea of path dependency, this kind of collective introspection helps to begin to shift the path into a new direction. On the basis of this, Cadestria's organizational defense then focused on providing the institutional and material conditions necessary for scholars to engage freely with each other as a community and aimed to contribute to the intergenerational survival of the academic community. In doing so, it sought to prioritize those most vulnerable to structural adjustment, young scholars and persecuted scholars. And as a consequence, it grew substantially in both size and influence. And this explains the apparent paradox of Cadestria's organizational growth at the, heart, at the height of the crackdown on African universities. Seen this way, collective deliberation has been at the heart of Cadestria's survival in two senses. Deliberation in the sense of reflection and debate on the socialness of the academic project. And deliberativeness in the sense of a judicious and intentional selection of allies and long-term goals over short-term exigencies. This has in turn helped to ground a commitment to supporting the most vulnerable in their intellectual community, which has in turn contributed to intergenerational renewal. And I think I just, I kind of, um, I wanted to comment on the picture that I've chosen to, um, it's by a South African artist uh, called Dumile Fani. And the title is Exile, the Fifth Stage, Cleansed Mind. And it was, uh, it was drawn when he was in forced exile in, in, in England. Um, and he died in exile, probably of a broken heart. But it, it represents the 
the, the fruits of painful self-reflection. So it's, it's the sense of overcoming incredible um, political and material odds through self-reflection, through introspection. And, and this is kind of um, what I'm trying to signal here in terms of the fruits of collective deliberation. So considered from this perspective then, perhaps Kadesha's main achievement during structural adjustment was to offer a living example of the value and the possibilities of the academic project in Africa and of how its limits and its contradictions might be negotiated. Its tenacious survival contributed to a shift in the discourse on structural adjustment, such that subsequent austerity packages have been very careful to distance themselves from the language of structural adjustment and keen to cultivate the appearance of democratic consensus. Its commitment to fundamental research has over the years come to be seen as having an abiding value, which outlasts consultancy research and has begun to function as a reference point in debates about reinvesting in higher education on the continent. And most importantly, perhaps, Kadesha has preserved and enriched African intellectual traditions, holding them in trust for future generations for a time when African universities were once again able to act as spaces of free thought. So this narrative is a partial one, it's very, very partial, but I think it suggests a possible mode of intellectual survival for us today. Faced with the prospect of another Great Depression, our ability to endure, I believe, may come down to our commitment to collective deliberation and solidarity with the most vulnerable among us. It may come down to our ability to engage in painful self-critique and to remember that our work is not only for us today, but for those who have yet to come. And it may hinge on the capacity of us as individuals to come together as a community. And remember that when faced with seemingly insurmountable material constraints, the realm of ideas still matters. All right, that's it, that's the end. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much uh, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I think there, there is so much rich uh, food for thought across the, across the whole of the lecture um, in relationship to the role of higher education in times of crisis, uh, the capacity of self-survival and autonomy of intellectual communities, um, the relevance of returning to the whole issue of structured adjustment, which, you know, for somebody like myself, this formative political engagement was around issues of structural adjustment. Uh, and I think that, you know, there are so many parallels now uh, to the challenges that universities face around the world uh, and generations blighted. So thank you, Nimi. Um, I'm sure that lots of people have lots of exciting questions, but what I suggest we do first is I'll assign everybody to some decent sized breakout rooms so you can have a, a, a short, what we call Sussex buzz, talk to each other, uh, and then we'll come back and uh, have some questions. So, You'll see yourself being redirected any second and we'll come back in around eight minutes. Enjoy your discussions. Thank you. 
Okay, can everybody hear me? Just nod. Okay, brilliant. Um, so uh, I hope that you you were able to have uh, some discussion about the content, and I now want to open the floor. We've got about 20, uh, 24 minutes um, for Q and A. So um, I can't see you all on the screen. Um, so it's if you want to ask a question, could you just put it in the chat? Just put a, a, a Q in the chat or or signal, and I'll I will ask you. No questions so far, Nimi. Obviously, you answered everything in that very literary presentation. Nobody? Okay, well done, Sarbani. Uh, you get bonus points for being brave. Uh, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor Nobeli. Um, so, Nimi, uh, I just want to ask, um, how do you think this kind of um, a pan-African um, solidarity community um, became possible? I mean, because this is a kind of a transnational um, you know, um, community and so what was the, do you, do, do you see, I mean, when I say that, how did it become possible? Do you see a similar possibility say in uh, South Asia or in um, Pan, uh, la la like Latin American country? Why, why, why say such a beautiful collaboration uh, in um, uh, like in the African continent and why not say in other continents and um, what kind of uh, power relations and dynamics. So we always have this, uh, even when it, it is pan-African, it is still a bounded one. And then when we are talking about SAPs and everything, we are usually talking in terms of against the, uh, like the Western uh, knowledge uh, apparatus. So what kind of conflicts and um, not, uh, power, uh, power relationships operated within this pan-African, uh, um, uh, you know, knowledge comments? And the third question is that uh, while the, the, the African governments were implementing SAPs, how do you think um, the ideas generated by um, uh, Cadestria, uh, how, how were they negotiating with their respective governments to implement, say, some kind of uh, welfare developmentalist policies? How, how did they do that? Um, shall I see if there's any other questions or should we just go? Uh, anybody want to signal another question? Okay, people are still warming up, Nimi. So you, you, you answer that question and then we'll, we'll come back with, a, with another set. Okay, thanks, Mary. Thanks, Shabani. Um, so how did it become possible? Well, actually, um, Cadestria was modeled on CAPSO, the Latin American um, kind of uh, uh, regional organization. But the difference between CAPSO and Cadestria is that CAPSO was always a, um, members of uh, research institutes and departments, whereas Cadestria now, because of, I guess, how profound structural adjustment was, moved from uh, uh, institutional membership to a mixed of a mix of individual and institutional membership. Um, because the institutions could no longer afford to pay membership fees. So the, the kind of political impetus for the development of CAPSO and also Cadestria was actually um, dependency theory and the idea of um, decoupling and the idea of um, searching for alternatives for autonomy. Um, and uh, it, it really, the kind of, so I mean, that was, that was one of the kind of main drivers. The other drivers, obviously, kind of the imagination of Pan-Africanism. Um, 
um, which has always been extremely rich and strong and deep, even if our African Union is not as rich or strong as or deep. Um, so in fact, uh, the, when I was in Dakar a couple of years ago, um, there, were, uh, there was a group of Chinese scholars who had come to Dakar to interview a number of elders within Cadestria. And, um, and they, uh, they were actually asking all of, uh, all of the members of Cadestria, how was it founded? What was the story? What were the challenges you faced? Because they want to set up something similar for Asia. Um, we do have the beginnings of something for Asia with the Arab Council of Social Sciences. So Cadestria tried to establish one in the 1980s and then it collapsed. And then, um, then the Arab Council for Social Sciences got reestablished um, a number of, I don't know, five or six years ago. Um, so the Arab Council for Social Sciences and Cadestria are quite close because there's a lot of overlap, you know? Um, yeah, so I think, I think the, I, I mean, I don't know what the internal dynamics of Asia are. I think Asia is a huge, vast continent, but um, there are already attempts to begin to create this kind of pan-Asian solidarity. Um, and then I think in terms of inequality within Cadestria, there are, I think there are, there are multiple inequalities, but one of them that was very strong for us, I think up until a couple of years ago was intergenerational inequality. So with the collapse of public universities, there'd been a kind of um, a collapse in training of postgraduate scholars. And so they've been, and so they, you know, um, if you don't get good training, you then have to go up against the likes of people like Mahmoud Mamdani, Samia Amir, Tantika Mkandawire, um, Am Amina Mama, Issa Shivji. <laughs> <laughs> and you haven't actually been trained properly, right? And so there, there is, it's very difficult to engage um, on an equal intellectual basis with them. And, and what I noticed, I think for a while, was this kind of ossification amongst the older generation of scholars, because they weren't being challenged by young scholars. They weren't being effectively challenged by young scholars. Um, so that was one kind of inequality, it was a kind of an intergenerational inequality, which is getting much better, I think, especially with the new secretary, uh, general secretary of, of Cadestria. But, and then a second one was gendered inequality. So um, women and feminist scholars more broadly, because there are some feminist scholars who are men like Paul Zalesa, had to fight really, really, really hard to get um, feminist theory onto the agenda of Cadestria. They had to fight extremely hard. Um, and, uh, you know, that their, their, their fight was largely, I think it was pretty successful, but it took a while and it has, there's been certain limitations on it in, in the past in terms of still we see, you know, funding going more to, to men than to women and that kind of thing. Um, it was only, only again, like in the last couple of years that I've seen a lot more women in Cadestria and now pretty much the whole of the leadership of Cadestria is women. <laughs> So that, that fight that was started in the 1980s, it took 30 years to get there, but um, we're, we're seeing um, a much kind of stronger role for women in the organization and a much bigger space for kind of radical feminist thought within the organization, its own kind of radical feminist thought. Um, yeah. I think. Okay. Thank you very much, Nimi. We, we've got a few questions. Um... I, I'm not sure, David uh, David Mills, whether your question was already answered. Um, um, okay. Yeah. Can I can I quickly sort of add a little bit more to it then? Sure. Because I mean, maybe that was great. It was really interesting. That response was really helpful at the internal debates. I wanted to ask you particularly about that decoupling debate because, I mean, you think about the way in which Mamduna Dani presents the debate between the Dar School and Makera in the 60s, between universalism of Mazuri and the sort of much more critical sort of um, intellectual Dar perspective. Did Kodisria enable those debates within it? Was there a debate about the consequences of decoupling for knowledge production? Because actually that has big implications for an African future, doesn't it? I mean, if African science doesn't need global science, then that has, you know, that that has major major implications and so i'm wondering to what extent because of the political vision and and you've, you've, you've captured the solidarity and the sort of the commitment to introspection brilliantly i really enjoyed that but whether there are any costs there in terms of intellectual openness okay and um uh, jacques uh, pretorius uh do you want to ask 
quickly your your question i think relevant um, yeah thanks mario um, just that i was part of a symposium this morning um, here at the university of cape town looking at the phd in africa and strengthening the african knowledge project and its its relevance um, looking at its history how it's come to be how it's been looked at and imagine how it can be reimagined in the future and at no point was there any reference to Kadesra in in a very interesting presentation and you know Raywin Canal was presenting um, I'm not saying they had to be responsible to to name it but and I'm very new in this space so I don't want to judge it but I just notice it as an admission given the the quality of what we've heard um, uh, this afternoon that in that conversation there was no reference to this this you know the space that obviously needs to be referenced anyway i don't know if there are any comments on that or if there's any understanding of what the politics of that emission may be or not yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, let me start with David. Um, such a great question. Ah, thank you. Um, I think, so So I don't think Kudestra is shaped around the idea of decoupling, but it is shaped around the idea of autonomy, and that autonomy is derived at, is arrived at through community, through collective action um, and collective deliberation. Um, but the the there is there is um there is actually quite like really sort of uh, important work that's been done within the cadastral space on this. So, for example, Paulin Antonji, the Beninese philosopher, um, has this beautiful classical piece on scientific dependency in Africa, which he published in 1990. I still think it is the reference point for thinking about um institutions, rules, values, and how they reproduce certain ways of thinking. Um, and so it's, it's this idea of like, how do we shift the institutions? How do we shift the rules of the game? Um, if the rules of the game are constantly specifying that there's a geography to reason, how do we undo, instead of shifting the geography of reason, how do we undo that geography so that the geography is no longer relevant to what counts as reasonable or not, right? Um, and, and that is, so, so I think, that's part of the, the debates between Dar es Salaam and Makarere, I think. That's the, the impression I get um, from Mahmoud Mamdani's kind of discussion of Ali Masri's um, ways of thought on this. But I, I also, yeah, but I also think there's another link that is sometimes forgotten, which is the link between Dakar and Dar es Salaam. And there's a particular kind of link around African Marxism, which is forgotten, and around the radicalism of 19, 1968. So when we think about 1968, we might think, oh, well, you know, there's the French student protests or whatever in, in, in France. But actually, 1968 marks this kind of moment of intellectual ferment. And um, that link between Dakar and, and Dar es Salaam is really, really important for Kadesri, and it actually provides the energy for Kadesri, um, particularly in terms of um, thinking about Ujamaa, <laughs> right? So Nyerere is thinking about kind of African socialism. Um, so those ideas are kind of informing, and 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 the early writings say um, Samia Min writes this beautiful piece together with Tandikam Kandawira and. Um, uh, um, the third scholar whose name I've forgotten right now, Abdullah Butra. And it's around how, for them, what's important is a kind of a critical view on, de on development. So, so, you know, in the same way that you have the Frankfurt School, <laughs> and around the same, you know, a little bit earlier, thinking about we will have a critical school of thought, you've got a similar kind of impetus coming from, from within this kind of set of traditions. Um, yeah, and that, and that actually creates a lot of space. For, for intellectual debate and fermentation, but it has always been contested within, from within. So those contestations haven't just been about intergenerational inequality or state feminism. They've also been around the place of the humanities in Cadestria, around the different roles of languages within Cadestria, around the modes of expression, um, the extent to which the narrative, the visual plays a role and not just the kind of quantitative or the social science components of it. Um, and so then 
to, to kind of come back to them, this the question around South Africa and UCT. I mean, I my own feeling is, is that we were South Africa was kind of cut off from the rest of the continent for a very long time because of apartheid and the boycott. And um, as a consequence, we still don't see ourselves as fully part of Africa. And we're often very ignorant of what is going on in the rest of our continent. Um, so, so for example, um, in terms of Cadestria, um, there, you know, with the exception of Achima Feji, um, there haven't been like really serious African scholars who've been really deeply involved in, in, in pedestrian. Um, I think that's changing over time, but that's, you know, that's one of the elements. A, a second element is it kind of, I'm sure you're aware of the Mamdani affair at UCT and kind of the debates around the notion of Africa at UCT. So it is, there are these kind of troubling <laughs> repetitions going on here where someone like Rowan Connell, who actually draws on Polan Antonji's work very, very fundamentally, is brought to the table, but Polan Antonji is not. Uh, it's very kind of, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think that's that's what I would say about UCT. <laughs> Perfect, thank you, um, uh, Alejandro, do you want to ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Navarri. Thank you, Nimi, for your lecture. It's very, very interesting. Uh, I, I live in Colombia. I am from Latin America, but I didn't know anything about this, and, and it has been so revealing for me. I have a, a question. Uh, Africa has become a kind of a laboratory uh, for educational experiment. Uh, and the IMF and the World Bank has been, I think, a lot of educational experiments uh, to defend uh, or support uh, experiment-based educational policies around the world. Uh, has Kudosria playing any role against this? Uh, and what has been the approach? You mentioned something about a post-structuralistic point of view, but uh, can you explain this uh, with more detail, please? Thank you. Um, and Nimi, can I add a couple of um, questions as well? Um, when I was listening to you um, about Codestria, it's, I, I feel it's quite romantic. Um, uh, and obviously you're, you're, you're passionate about this, but when I, if I go back to the works of Samir Amin talking about this period, uh, where he talked about structural adjustment as being um, a process of recolonization of Africa, whereby um, the, the debt crisis facilitated the mechanism to undermine South-South solidarity and the idea of the third world in its political sense. And also um, BJ Prashad's uh, book on uh, the history of the third world, the people's history of the third world, where he really talks about this period as the death of the Bandung era. Um, I'm just wondering whether what you're telling us is the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end. Um, and then the second question I have, um, you know, you mentioned uh, World Bank and uh, consultancy staff. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about whether in your research you uncovered different types of North-South relationships, because, for example, I'm uh, um, on the board of management of the War on Want uh, uh, NGO, radical NGO, works on South, North, South, South solidarity, has for many decades. Uh, many decades was born out of the labor movement, um, worked with frontline defenders in Ireland, which has been working with Turkish academics that have been imprisoned and uh, helping them to support them, with Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Germany, with a whole range of uh, basically radical northern organizations that often work in these contexts of very difficult situation. And I wondered if you, Kodesria has those kind of relationships and whether you uncovered some of those and, and, and whether there were any issues of that. Because often we kind of, you know, we produce these binaries, North, South, West evil, South good, but actually we know it's more complex than that. And uh, I'm just wondering if you could kind of nuance that a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so let me start with the experiments. Um, Yes, uh, there was um, two uh, special issues of the bulletin on um, experimentation in Africa that were published this year. 
um, just uh, about uh, the, the second one came out last month and then the, the first one came out about two months ago. Um, and on the basis of that, there's going to be a special issue of African development um, titled African Perspectives on Experimentation that's coming out, say, hopefully June next year. Um, so yeah, the, the question of experimentation, randomized control trials, and the relationship between research and policy um, is very much one of the debates I think that's happening within Cadestria's community at the moment. Um, so thank you so much for asking that question, Alejandro. Um, yeah, it's really spot on. And then Mario, yes, it is a, it, I, I really struggle, you know, <laughs> in terms of, um, you know, when you love a community so much, <laughs> you know, um, and I think I, I kind of, so I, I think, I think you're right, there is a level of, of romanticization, but it's not, it's not a, um, when I wrote this, it was during the student protests in South Africa. And um, a number of student activists at the time would express this kind of profound pain and sorrow that they felt like the academic project was fundamentally tainted and irreparable. It was, it could never be, um, uh, rescued from, from its violence. It was just a deeply violent project and just needed to be burnt down to the ground. And, and, and I found myself by the time I was writing it was, this, was almost like, but no, look, we can actually build something beautiful here. You know, um, it has contradictions, it has limitations, but we can build something beautiful. And so it was, it ended up being written for the student movement in that, in some sense, um, with that, it, so so I don't I don't forget that and I and it's very hard for me to forget that because of now the second phase of structural adjustment which is happening. Um, it's you know I think we need we need things of beauty to hold on to in our lives. So that is that is that is I will grant it, but I will defend it, the romanticization. Um, nonetheless, um, I think you're 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 so right in terms of the collapse of Bandung humanism. So, you know, very few people even know what Bandung is anymore. People in my generation are like, ah, Bandung what? So um, capturing that idea and, 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 and bringing it out again and, and resuscitating it and reworking it and revitalizing it is to my mind, one of the most critical projects of the 21st century. Um, and I know some young scholars are beginning to do that work. So I'm, I'm hoping that that becomes um, potentially a, a way forward. Uh, but I don't know if to say the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning, you know, like Mario, like history overflows itself. <laughs> you know, it, we overflow ourselves with meaning. We don't know that a particular action will lead in specific ways. So to, to, to comment on that is very hard at this moment. The, the one thing I would say though, um, so yeah, so justified romanticism, <laughs> the collapse of Bandung humanism, yes, recolonization, yes. And then in terms of having more kind of nuanced views, I, I think many Kudestra scholars would feel what you're saying very deeply because, you know, they resisted the idea of like just saying, oh, well, it was the IMF and the World Bank that imposed structural adjustments on us and everything was externally imposed, right? And at the same time, they also resisted the idea that everything was down to the internal dynamics of that society, that say neo-patrimonialism was to blame for all of our problems. Um, so it's this very kind of careful balancing act. And in fact, that kind of careful balancing act is at the heart of dependency theory, isn't it? Um, so instead of the kind of binaries that we often have, north, south, east, west, dependency theory has, you know, it's a network and you've got a core and then, you know, as you move out further and further towards the periphery, you get weaker and weaker. So, so what does that mean? It means that forming relationships with the core is really important, but equally important is forming relationships between actors in the periphery. And that's the important point. Like so I mentioned, for example, the Committee for Academic Freedom in Africa, right? Um, which was uh, Sylvia Federici and um, uh, George Capensis as well. That got 
influenced by or inspired by Kadesha's academic work, academic freedom work. And they actually created a, a very positive relationship. So that's an example of a positive relationship of solidarity. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize those other kinds of ties because we, we don't see enough of them anymore and they're very fragile. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, Nimi. Um, we're coming, we seem to have even gone past the end. Um, I've noticed that um, we just have one more question from Meredith, if you want to go for that one just to finish off the day. Um, thank you so much. That was fascinating. I would love to understand the relationship between Contestria's funding sources and the production of particular kinds of knowledge, particularly relating to development discourse. Could you shed any light on this? I'm sure you can shed lots of light on that, can't you, Nimi? <laughs> Um, so I think I think because Kadesh has been very careful about the kind of funding that it has received in the past, it's been able to have a more kind of autonomous intellectual project. Um, so, for example, um, it's been able to go well. Let's decouple the notion of Africa from development. <laughs> we can think about. We can think about the continent in ways that exceed development, right? Um, uh, but but maybe the impact of donor funding has been more an inadvertent kind of hollowing out of the internal dem democratic processes within pedestrian. So so what happens is, is that, and I, I will you give me just one minute to finish this moment because I, 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 it's it's important maybe to counter the romanticization of games even. Um, the General Assembly is the ultimate governing body of Kedestria, and it's, you, you kind of come together in one place physically and then you vote for who is going to be governing, like who's going to be managing the agenda, uh, Kedestria for three years. And that group that manages Kedestria for three years, which is like the presidents and the deputy presidents and so on, they work together to select um, the secretariat which is um, uh, people who are hired and whose full-time job it is to run the admin of Kedestria because it's a really huge community and there is administrative work. And that admin is run from Dhaka. Now, because almost all of the funds these days don't come from membership fees, but rather from donors, um, and the administrative people are in charge of getting that donor funding and raise fundraising, that gives them a huge amount of de facto power so if they don't like someone, <laughs> potentially, they find someone who's being troublesome, they just don't invite them to the General Assembly or they just don't pay for their tickets to come because lots of people don't have money to fly to Dakar. It's really expensive to fly within Africa. So they just don't provide money or they just don't respond to emails. And then you no longer have a troublesome person at your General Assembly who can, who can vote for whoever. That is a real possibility, and I think it sometimes does happen within the general within Kadesha. And so you've got an actual hollowing out of democracy and an inversion of the democratic process, such that, in fact, the donors have better oversight over the finances of Kadesha than the General Assembly does. That's profoundly disturbing to me. Um, and I think it's something that is changing. I'm hoping it's changing. Um, but it, it is a it is a it's a way in which even the most positive kinds of donor influence can end up subverting fundamentally the aims of an organization. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Nimi, I think that was a really, really good session and a really good Q and A. Um, thanks everybody for participation. Thank you, Nimi, for an excellent talk. Um, next week's lecture, um, is uh, week six of the peer network uh, is towards a political economy of education and conflict in South Africa. And we're carrying on the, the kind of African theme with uh, uh, Yunus Omar uh, and Azim Badrudian, two colleagues from the University of Cape Town. Uh, I think Yunus is taking the lead uh, on that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next week. Um, again, please tell your friends uh, to join, share the uh, Zoom link. The same link is for every week, so no need to change. Uh, please encourage other people to attend and also direct them to the CIE uh, YouTube page where all the recordings of the previous lectures and future lectures will be stored. Uh, again, 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a busy week for a range of reasons. UK has just gone into lockdown. Uh, US is going into meltdown. So we're looking forward to uh, seeing you all next week. Goodbye, everyone.